very lovely details about this film, and there are many of them, is that he played the gun soul in the original Maltese Falcon. And oh, here he is all of a sudden in this picture. The bumbling about, guy, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, okay. And he plays a cab driver, obviously, here. And there are a lot of details like that that make this picture wonderful to watch. For instance, in Hammett's living room, you see him writing. And there, if you look carefully and you pay attention to detail, his lamp is a Maltese falcon. It's this black Sweet. obsidian bird, which is just great to find. Well, for uh, a movie buff like you, it's got to be a great movie to watch. That's a pleasure. Samuel Fuller another sort of masterful director of film noir type movies like this uh, is there he plays an old man in the pool hall and all of those details just play in so well with this there are a number of pictures that have tried to recreate that sort of magical bogey like atmosphere that you got from from pictures like maltese falcon or the original the postman always went rings twice or double indemnity those films uh, I don't think any of them have succeeded uh, nearly as well as this one, not even Chinatown, which in many ways tried to do the, the same kind of thing. One of the amazing parts of this picture is it was all filmed on the set at Zoe Trobe Studios, and they had total control of the lighting as a result, and, and you could see the sunsets, and everything is done with enormous sensitivity and shadow. The star who you saw playing Dashiell Hammett is Frederick Forrest, who won an Oscar nomination for his uh, best Supporting Actor for The Rose, and was also very memorable in Apocalypse Now, and was also very forgettable in One from the Heart, another Coppola film, which I think Coppola himself would rather forget. But uh, here he's very good. The only problem with his performance is occasionally it looks like he's playing Jason Robards, playing Dashiell Hammett, because he, he looks so much like Robards in the earlier portrayal. Uh, and the, the young lady that you saw in the film is Mary Lou Henner from the Taxi series, who... Uh, is, is very good playing a librarian uh, who's also sort of becomes Hammett's sidekick in this fantasy adventure. What did this cost to make? Do you have any idea? They are not talking about that because the film was so troubled. Uh, part of the problem here was a language problem, believe it or not. Uh, Coppola fell in love with the work of a German director, Wim Wenders, who had done a picture called um, the Amer My American Friend, The American Friend, and Wenders came over uh, and there were two years spent in pre-production writing and rewriting the script and then two years spent in principal production and then they waited a while longer and went back and reshot and all sorts of difficulties but it certainly it certainly probably was was in the 20 million range and it was one of those pictures that helped to put his studio under uh, and I'm really very glad to to find this film as good as it is because that whole experiment that he did with American Zoetrope uh, where he was going to do everything on the set and, and have a group of uh, sort of uh, repertory players who were going to work together was a noble experiment, a high-risk experiment. Uh, Coppola specializes in that sort of thing. And, uh, of course, One from the Heart uh, uh, was a disaster. And I didn't like The Outsiders, as you remember, which is also a, a, a sort of a product of that era. But Here, that one's doing well, though, isn't it? The Outsiders? It, it, it did. It did better than, than, than any of the others. And, and, by the way, I think it did better than this film will do. Unfortunately, it's hard to see with a stupid advertising campaign that Warner Brothers is releasing for this thing, how they're going to find any audience for it. And it's a shame. People should go to see it. The music, John Barry, a very jazzy, atmospheric score, as you heard a little bit in that clip, wonderful. And, and altogether, uh, in a summer that is filled with uh, what one of my colleagues has described as techno trash, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see a picture like this. Um, you remember how much I hated Blue Thunder last week. Uh, I wish that uh, maybe one-third of the people who will be wasting their money on that picture would go to see this one and try to make it a success. And please help Francis Ford Coppola. You can either help him or you can turn the page. And I say let's have a telethon. <laughs> Um, we could, <laughs> what we is could your, sell an evening with Bill Tush to benefit Francis Ford Coppola. Is that like the George Clinton story? I'll make a nickel for that one. <laughs> what is your rating? I will have to give it an eight. Uh, the only reason that I would give it a, uh, uh, not even a higher rating than that is because the sets and the scenery and the beautiful production design by Dean Tavalaris, who did the Godfather movie so memorably and, uh, and also did Apocalypse Now, the production design sort of overwhelms the actors. And, uh, but, but other than that, it's a marvelous picture. I think almost anyone who sees it, particularly anyone who likes old movies, will love it. You know what's running on cable now is uh, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, which I know you probably really loved, didn't you? No, I, I rather enjoyed it. Did you it. like oh, that? Oh, sure. I thought the it was a The editing was great. Idea. Have you ever seen that? The Steve Martin movie? I didn't see it. They edited no. in clips from, I guess, like 30 old black and white films with Barbara Stanwyck and Humphrey Bogart and Charles Lawton and matched up the scenes, and you couldn't tell the difference. No, it's really, you, you get at one point, you get to see Barbara Stanwyck from Double Indemnity sort of embracing Steve Martin, oh, yeah. which boggles the mind. 
but uh, it, uh, Rachel Ward was terrific in that movie. I liked yeah. the film. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, this is a, a little bit more self-important, pretentious, serious homage to that kind of movie than uh, to, uh, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Was well, there a lot of action in this film? Uh, you get to see a chase scene through a Chinese brothel, uh, which is fairly interesting. Uh, uh, you get right to... One. <laughs> yeah, yeah just one the Chinese... thing I'd sit up nights for. <laughs> the Chinese brothel was... Uh, part, part of the plot, by the way, is, is Lydia Lay, who played one of the lovely prostitutes on Dr. Detroit, uh, the Chinese prostitute Jasmine in that picture, is here in a much more important role playing Crystal Ling, who was sold into slavery at the age of nine and, and goes to San Francisco's Chinatown, where she uh, ends up sort of uh, being abused uh, and, and then sort of takes revenge. And, and so there, there, there's a tremendous amount of shooting and chasing involved with that. Okay, thank you, Michael. Always fun to see you. Bob, have a good trip back to thank New you. York. Joanna will look for Buffalo Bill on NBC. That looks like a lot of fun. Tomorrow, our guests will be Mary Wilson from The Supremes, country music star and pop music star Bertie Higgins, Justine Bateman from the NBC series Family Ties, Lee Berger from Dynasty, author Nancy Collins will talk about women and their mentors. And we'll also be going to the Future World Expo, which was held recently here in Los Angeles, where we looked at this car that sells for $150,000. It's called a vector. We'll show you more of it tomorrow. See you then.